during the presentations, we we'll have a short award ceremony. As you know, it's the practice to give awards to the best brand for each of the uh, sorry, for each uh, of the session, the best uh, astral for each of the session. And today we will be awarding for track B. And then uh, this will be followed by a short uh, announcement. So I think we can we can start. It's my pleasure to introduce uh, the first chair, who is our uh, Dr. Benjamin Dubadai. Benjamin is head of policy and health diplomacy at the African Center for Disease Control and Prevention. He was a senior staff officer for HIV AIDS, tuberculosis, malaria, and other infectious diseases at the American Union Commission from 2009 to 2018. He has a strong professional experience in strategic planning, administration, management, and evaluation of policies, programs, and public health. He also has a strong expertise in project management. He also has a good knowledge of coordination mechanisms, including multidisciplinary and most central team, partnership development, negotiating skills, and advocacy. Uh, Benjamin specializes in special degrees at the University of Pernalion. HIV AIDS and sexual reproductive health, reproductive health, infectious genome theory, and epidemiology. He holds a master's degree in population studies and public health. Uh, he has worked with many organizations and has also worked in the most of all in his native country, Republic of China. It's my pleasure to invite you today. Thank you very much, Dr. Levine, for the introduction. Good morning, everybody. And the first chair for this presentation, I will announce the first speaker, Professor Lila Baird Becker. She is the chief operating officer of Desmond Tutu HIV Foundation. Professor Lila Baird Becker, she is the deputy director of the Desmond Tutu HIV Center. Institute of Infectious Disease and Molecular Medicine. She's also, uh, she is also a physician scientist, has a keen interest in HIV, tuberculosis, and related diseases. Her research and interest include programmatic and actual research on HIV rollout and TB integration, prevention of HIV in women, youth, and men who have sex with men. She has contributed to a number of from Desmond Tutu HIV Center on topics relevant to the South African HIV and TB indigenous. In their call with the foundation, she is passionate about community development. She is also the major past president of the International Health Society. So help me welcome the professor in that day. Next. This promise um, of accessing 
to train and getting trained to as many people as possible means that we have this promise of treatment as prevention. So with enough people accessing treatment and virally suppressed, we uh, with the evidence from HPT and O5 to partners one and two, this remarkable concept of undertaking means untransmissible. That actually there's this promise of prevention if there was enough treatment. However, next. We know that um, through the impact of treatment, we are starting to see some uh, improvement in incidence rates. So what you see on the right in this region, some reduction in incidence, although there are regions on the continent and of course the eco-region that we're all very concerned about, where we do still see an increase in incidence. Next. So globally, whilst again we're seeing that slope coming down, it really isn't coming down fast enough. And as you see in the blue line, 75% of infections happening in this region, 1.7 million last year. Next. And of course, our region is where most of the prevalence is occurring. And that uh, donut graph on the, on the right tells you where most of the infections are. So, largely a generalized epidemic. Next. And of note, where most of the non suppression is occurring, where viral load is still detectable is in the same regions where we have a lot of prevalence. Next. So the reality is that we have not reached the goal that we were hoping for. In fact, 63% initiated around the world, but 50% of those virus are uh, suppressed. And so what you see is that there are still susceptible people around the world at risk of HIV acquisition. And four important, five important uh, trials have recently uh, just been completed, particularly in this region, looking at the impact of universal testing treatment, have shown that whilst we may see some reduction in incidence, um, up to 30% in, in at least uh, a couple of the, the UTT trials, we haven't uh, got quite to the global epidemic control that we need, and so we really need to do more. Next slide. And so 1.7 million infections in 2018, amounting to almost 5,000 infections a day. There is no doubt primary prevention has to be on the agenda. Next slide. And this is the prevention gap, um, and it is because of this that we today um, are happy that biomedical prevention has suddenly exploded in the last two years, and I'll be telling you about those in the next few minutes. Next slide. <coughs> next. So whilst we have a fantastic suite of uh, prevention options, and uh, one of them is mother to child, which I will not be covering today, but I sworn that until we eliminate mother to child, I'm going to say that absolutely every uh, talk I have an opportunity to, that we have to work harder to eradicate mother to child. Today, 300 children will be born infected with their child. We have to do more. But in today's talk, I'm going to concentrate on pre exposure prophylaxis because it is universal, it's discreet, it is sex act independent. It's easy, it's safe, tolerable, and highly effective. Next. So if you like, the way to think about it is, it is a chemical condom that potentially safeguards those three million odd people who are at risk for the and AIDS has told us we need to reach the crimes prevention as soon as possible. And it takes into consideration that if the, the positive a uh, sex partner is not known in terms of their status or not undetectable, then that person is uh, protected from HIV infection. So an additional option is in the prevention suite. Next. Next. So starting with PrEP past. Next slide. It all started, if you can remember, in Vienna 2010, with the 
increase the WHO trial that not of the gel as the Caprice team announced that they have seen a 30 percent reduction in women who were using the Tenofa gel of vaginal microbicide. Thereafter, we had the Global IPEC study, Partners Group, and TV2, all of which contributed to the licensing of uh, our Truvada Tenofa they interested to be in print. And following that, you see over a five to six year period, the licensing occurring throughout the world and the movement towards the rollout of oral pre-exposure prophylaxis. Next slide. And it was in fact up to 12 randomized trials, some with the placebo arm, some with the no prep arm, that showed that overall there was a risk reduction, we can expect a risk reduction of 0.5 in people using prep beta 0.3. Uh, in men who have sex with men, again 0.3. Happily, in women who have vaginal sex, 0.5. We're struggling a little bit with the young people, 0.7. Uh, but further to that, a couple more trials, uh, in particular amongst things, Proud and IPG using an intimate movement, according to the human thing. We actually saw effectiveness rates up to a 90% reduction of uh, HIV leading to the WHO making a strong recommendation that oral prep is recommended for all people at a substantial risk of HIV around the world. Next slide. Unfortunately, two of those randomized uh, clinical trials conducted in this part of the world uh, amongst women who have sex with men uh, did not show effectiveness. Um, and this led to the notion that perhaps women didn't want prep or oh, that prep didn't work in, in, in African women. And there were various scientific um, uh, speculations, such as perhaps, of course, that this is a KNC region, uh, there was tissue penetration problems, viral load very high in partners, vaginal dysbiosis, um, abrogating the effect of, of prep and, and potentially is to Next slide. In terms of women not wanting prep, when we have offered prep to young women in the southern region, and I believe this is the, the case throughout Africa, women in fact are very excited about uh, oral prep. They want to be in control of their sexuality and they feel that they, they can be part of the movement. Next slide. So, what actually happened in these two clinical trials, one fed prep and the other voice? It seems that Approximately half of the women never had any tenofa by any of that levels um, at the time of the trial. So fewer than a quarter of the women had tenofa that detected in all of these samples. And the remaining women had some evidence of using the product, albeit intermittently. So really, the problem here was not that the product doesn't work, but that in these populations of women, and various reasons have been raised, Suspicion around the placebo, suspicion about the, the actual uh, very new innovation, not understanding the infection taken. Various reasons there is why women do not use uh, the standard product. Next slide. But a meta analysis followed looking at all this, the trials that involved cisgendered women. And in fact, when oral prep is used effectively um, in at least at least 32 percent of the time, it was a 50 percent efficacy. Uh, sorry, a 32 percent efficacy with 50 percent use, and a 61 percent efficacy with 25 uh, percent use. So again, coming back to this notion, typically a product needs to be used in order to have an effect. Next slide. And importantly, uh, amongst women in our region who are wanting to conceive. This becomes a very important biomedical tool. Using prep at the time of safe conception protects the uninfected mother. Um, and we know this is a time when young women are at high risk of HIV position. So, prep for women for safe conception is definitely um, something to consider. Next slide. So, what has been our experience to date? Well, there have been about 131 demonstrations. Uh, studies that have followed the licensing of oral tribal effect. Um, 
Okay, this, these have occurred in 68 countries involving 54 stakeholders. But unfortunately, this hasn't been altogether um, organized in a systematic way. And I think there's some lessons we can learn post our quick uh, licensure that we can take forward. And I'll come back to that. But the recommendations would be that we, we organize the post trial approval period in a more systematic way. Next slide. And so it's taken about seven years for us to get from the point where we knew that trip was effective to the point that we are now having large uh, bridge to scale and bigger rollouts such as uh, is occurring in the dreams at the PEPFAR program. Next slide. So seven years on, uh, the trip has been licensed in a number of countries around the world, um, and there are about 400,000 people using oral prep today. Mostly, unfortunately, where prevalence is not that high. Next slide. So the prevention gap um, is we have 1.7 million infections because we're not quite where we need to be in terms of treatment as prevention. And clearly, having we move our biomedical technology out to those people who need it most. Next slide. So, in summary, I think we've had a slow start in many settings. There's still some countries that need to get off the starting blocks. There has been offering hesitancy to women, particularly African women. Um, health policy <laughs> and practitioners have all been barriers with beliefs, concerns about safety, concerns about resistance, and sexual disinhibition all playing into that. And implementation science has not been well coordinated and has been slow to provide the answers to policy makers. Next slide. So let's move to where we are today. Next slide. South Africa, Kenya, and the US are the countries that have had most of the initiations, about 25,000. I want to shout out to Zim as well, uh, that is closely behind um, Kenya and Uganda. Next slide. And Kenya has been very much the poster child with their road map to prevention. They were first to get off the starting blocks in Africa. And you can see uh, that they moved quickly. Uh, next slide. Um, and have initially target, targeted discord and trouble, but increasingly having a focus on young women and girls. Next slide. In my own country, there has been a slow start and um, again with a phase in people's focus. Um, next slide. But now we're beginning to catch up with young women and girls, which is where most of our incidents is uh, occurring. And next slide. And I'm pleased to announce that in 2020, we will be moving to more than 3,000 uh, primary health care clinics throughout the country with the goal of more than a, a half a million oral prep users next year alone. Next slide. In my own organization, we've done a number of uh, pilot studies, and I want to just highlight a few lessons we learned. First and foremost, amongst every single one of these pilots, with young women and girls and young men of sex with men, we have seen extraordinary high asymptomatic STIs at baseline. So we certainly are pulling in a population of young people who are engaging in condom with sex. Next slide. We've learned that demand creation and familiarization is key. There is a high interest. The non-return rate early on is high and concerning, but I think this is about people figuring out whether they think oral pain is for them or not. Uh, those people who stick with it, who persist, and um, seem to stick with it into the long run. And here it starts well, but it does decrease over time. Um, and there seems to be excellent self-identification of people who need prep. Non-users express concern about effectiveness, stigma, side effects, and harm and dispersion. Our model, therefore, is to think about um, persistence as being something that people cycle on and cycle off with, um, and using prep when they perceive themselves to be at risk, and stopping their use when they don't. And Jessica Haber described this as effective use, and I think this is the paradigm that we need to get used to. Uh, and 
expand. So as we think about the kind of cascade, I think rather than the adherence, we should think about effective use, about persistence, and then this notion that people will cycle in and out of it. Next slide. And the best way that I can imagine oral PIP is really the best analogy is that of contraception. So we started with first generation oral contraception, but we became very aware that when people were offered choice, and their stick, stickability, if you like, the use of their, their retention within uh, oral contraceptive use uh, increased. And I imagine that this is going to be the same with PrEP. And so we need to diversify our PrEP options. Um, and that's what I'll talk about in the next time. So the first diversification, of course, is taking us back to topical, that of the vaginal uh, ring. Uh, two trials completed in this part of the world with delivery vaginal ring showing a 0.5 risk reduction. Um, and now the vaginal risk is sitting with the European Medicine Agency um, for approval for Section 58 in a WHO recommendation for women in low and middle income countries as a second line to all of them. And we're hoping to hear about that very soon. Next slide. The next innovation has been to look at other ways of dosing. And one of the first um, uh, trials that showed the efficacy of the PEP, of course, was IPGAP, which employed this notion of quickly dependent oral PEP, the 211 regimen, two pills within 24 hours, 48 hours of sex, one pill 24 hours later, and another pill 24 hours after that. Um, and it is now being, that showed them a, a very high effectiveness amongst men who are sexually men. There is now an open medical study on the way in the Paris, it's in Rhoda and shoots the results early next year. Men are choosing, half of them are choosing daily prep and half of them are choosing the 211. Next slide. The next innovation is to talk about a different kind of antiviral. And of course, the one, uh, that has recently been in the spotlight has been the cousin of uh, TDF, F, F, TDF, and that is ITAC. Um, it is a prodrug which has lower plasma level, less toxicity, and is a smaller pill to take. It is also recommended um, for oral pain. And uh, the, the randomized trial which has been completed next time. And the trial was called Discover. Uh, it looked, it, it was a non inferiority compact comparing FTDF to FTAP, and you see that non inferiority was reached. Next slide. And as mentioned, because of lower plasma levels, quicker action, uh, we do see less toxicity with this particular intervention, less renal, less bone toxicity. Next slide. So this uh, has been approved by the FDA. Uh, unfortunately, because the discovered trial did not include sustainable women, the uh, licensure is not a woman. Next slide. Many people have been concerned about resistance in oral pain. So I think one or uh, two slides to this, just to note that most of the resistance we've seen in people taking oral pain have been amongst women people starting oral prep whilst seroconverting. So it's very important that people are not acutely infected when they initiate oral prep. So you see in this slide, the bulk of the resistance that has occurred, and there hasn't been much, um, has been in those people who were in that window period uh, of seroconversion in oral prep initiated. Next slide. And John Mellis has described this very nicely as the zone of resistance risk, and it depends how wide that window is. So in other words, if somebody is not taking their drug, they may become infected, but they can't become resistant. If they are taking drug very well, they're going to be protected. They're not going to get infected and again won't be resistance. But there's that zone in the middle, which occurs uh, particularly when somebody's just uh, becoming infected. Next slide. So scaling up print has already shown some benefits. So here are um, four cities, San Francisco, uh, Seattle, London, and Sydney, 
um, where you can see that it has been a really very nice real world doc uh, documented reduction in incidents. Obviously, in all these cities, there has also been rollout of treatment. Next slide. So this really does, you know, give us the evidence that when treatment and climate prevention come together, we do see uh, an aggregation of infections. Next slide. So the first generation of PrEP now is well established, where rollout has been slow in some regions, mostly due to policy costs, funding, and misinformation. However, rollout has steadily been increasing. And we're starting to see the first diversification in PrEP options, frequency of dosing, type of antiretrovirals, and route of administration. Next slide. So I'm going to move now quickly through the future. Next slide. And obviously, we want to think about formulations and active ingredients as we think about what the future looks like. Next slide. I'm going to turn these the super hat heroes. The injectable, the infusible, the topical, and the implantable. Next slide. So starting first with the injectable, cabotegravir is well on its way. This uh, cabotegravir long acting is a long acting suspension for delivery by intramuscular injections. It's a sister or brother, if you like, of dolutegravir and interface inhibitor. Uh, next slide has a very long half, half life. Next slide. And then there you see the phase two which show that cabotegravir is safe and well tolerated, um, and the dose that has been chosen is an eight-week dose. Next slide. So there are two trials underway at the moment, um, both uh, in Africa and in the first world, in men of sex between transgender women and um, cisgender women. Next slide. The one consideration you have to think about is that long half-life means that there is a long tail and when administering patients with a long half-life we may need an oral feeding to ensure that we don't have toxicity and we may need a prolonged sub we may have a prolonged sub therapeutic tail which may also require um, cover with oral treatment next slide what about the infusible um, and yesterday, Larry introduced you to the organ neutralizing antibodies. I'll go through this next slide. The neutralizing antibodies um, have great promise. They've really come to their own in the last few years, but we have identified new targets on the HIV virus. The first uh, that is being developed is BRCL1, which targets the CD4 binding site on GP120. Next slide. And BRCO1 has um, shown, next slide, uh, that it has um, neutralizing capability that is good and um, with a, uh, a good um, a range of uh, viruses that it is able to take on. Um, and so, again, next slide, we are uh, developing this in clinical trial. We have study fully enrolled and we will be getting these results uh, next year again, both in men of sexual and women in sub Africa. Next slide. So we now have a wonderful batch of broadly neutralizing antibodies with a, a, a wide range of great potency. Next slide. And uh, very exciting. There has already been a combination of these sites into one single body neutralizing tricyclic antibody, which is described very nicely in science a couple of years ago. Next slide. And there you see the triple um, tricyclic antibody. Next slide. Um, and although each of those antibodies have some breakthrough infection when combined into this tricyclic, we really see no infection in animal um, studies uh, to date. Uh, so this is also moving into human clinical trials now. Next slide. So a very exciting pipeline of multi neutralizing antibodies coming down the pipeline. And I'm sure that Africa will be contributing to the R&D uh, for this as well. Next slide. The next are the implantable, very exciting. 
There are a number of animal development institutions in tech, have a tip of that, um, and I'm about to tell you about a very exciting new molecule in Sinatra. These are reversible and renewable, um, uh, long acting, uh, of course. Next slide. And this molecule, I believe, could be a game changer. It's incredibly potent. It has a new mode of action, um, previously known as MK8591. This lateral here is the new kid on the block. Next slide. So you see that it can be put into an implant. The first dose finding studies have been done, and uh, this implant may be able to deliver uh, oral and implantable prep over an annual period, so 12 month period. Next slide. It is being developed in the oral football first, and we're about to move into the early studies to look at a monthly pill. So a tiny pill taken once a month. Uh, as pre exposure prophylaxis. Next slide. The topicals, very exciting micro needles, and um, so a way to deliver antiretrovirals via micro needles. Next slide. Um, and insulin, insulin uh, has also been developed in this way. Can you move along the slide, please? Thank you. And so, uh, very exciting time, I think you would agree. Um, we have uh, a lot that um, we can do as, as a group. Um, and I think the, the next few um, years will really um, open up all kinds of opportunities for us. Thank you so much. <laughs> very interesting presentation. I know that this is a very difficult task. But you were out of the way. Thank you so much. Let me congratulate you. I have the honor to present the support for the president of this session, the person of Professor Sidi Panda. Qui est médecin épidémiologiste, chercheur et chef du département de santé publique à l'Institut de recherche en sciences de la santé et à l'ESS. Il a passé au professeur d'épidémiologie et directeur adjoint de l'Institut africain de santé publique et également fellow euh, de l'Institut de santé publique. Il a conduit plusieurs recherches sur plusieurs sujets, y compris euh, sur le VHCA sur la santé de la population, sur la nutrition, sur la maladie infectieuse, ainsi que sur euh, les systèmes de santé. Il a publié plusieurs articles dans plus de, euh, dans plus de 120, 120 articles dans ce de journaux avec des études. Il a également conduit plusieurs recherches avec euh, plusieurs recherches de l'Université. BBCTP, la Banque mondiale, le FDA, l'OMS, le SNAP, l'Union européenne, euh, dans le contexte ouest-africain. Donc, euh, professeur Céline Panda, je vous invite à acheter. Merci. Merci de votre appel. Alors, Je m'avais plutôt présenté le second intervenant de cette plénière, et donc euh, M. Masuki Ki Chandung, qui est le directeur technique de l'ANC au Sénégal, l'ANCS au Sénégal. M. Chandung est titulaire d'un master en travaux en travail social, d'un délit en addictologie. La faculté de médecine de Dakar, il a plus de 15 ans d'expérience au niveau communautaire, en particulier dans le domaine de la santé, du genre et des droits humains. Depuis 2006, il occupe euh, le poste de chargé des programmes de l'Alliance nationale contre le SIDA, ANCS, l'une des plus grandes organisations de la société civile du Sénégal, qui est récipiendaire principal principales du Fonds mondial. De lutte contre les sida, le paludisme et la tuberculose. À 
actuellement, il occupe le poste de directeur technique de l'Alliance nationale des communautés pour la santé et directeur du centre de pratique internationale et chargé S à la race sur les populations qui couvrent la plus de l'ouest, du centre, du nord et le nord. Alors, il est donc chargé de la gestion des programmes techniques, des programmes du Fonds mondial, du programme de l'USAID, du programme régional Afrique de l'Alliance internationale, du programme régional sur la réduction des risques de transmission de TB et des comorbidités en Afrique de l'Ouest et le projet multi-pays pour réduire sur l'accès aux services de santé sexuelle et reproductive pour les jeunes populations clés en Afrique, finalisées, financées par Expertise France. Donc, euh, c'est cette personnalité qui a une grande expérience dans les programmes communautaires, et notamment en ce qui concerne la santé sexuelle et reproductive, les droits humains et les droits. Et j'invite donc à prendre la parole pour donc sa présentation à cette dernière. Bonjour. Je vais faire ma présentation en français et vous prie de prendre nos écouteurs pour nos amis en français. Je voudrais en attendant de ma présentation présenter les excuses de Mme Maguen Boch, la directrice de l'ANCS qui devait faire cette présentation, mais qui malheureusement n'a pas pu se soumettre à nous des raisons de demandant de sa Nous allons donc parler aujourd'hui de l'engagement des communautés et du leadership de la société civile dans la réponse de l'ESCDA. Japon. Japon, s'il vous plaît. Cet engagement qui s'est manifesté dès les premières heures de l'investissement à VIH, avec une contribution importante de la société civile, notamment dans le plaidoyer, la sensibilisation, l'éducation des communautés, mais aussi la gestion du programme. La mobilisation des communautés pour le développement de vastes programmes de sensibilisation à travers les réseaux régionaux comme Africa a été au point important pour sensibiliser les masses et donner l'information sur le VIH et la prévention du VIH. Dès le début de l'épidémie, des personnes vivant avec le VIH se sont manifestées. On développe un leadership important pour faire des témoignages et expliquer à la population qu'est-ce que c'est le VIH. L'engagement des religieux s'est aussi manifesté très tôt avec déjà des caravanes de sensibilisation à travers l'Afrique mais aussi le premier symposium qui a été organisé à Dakar dans les années 80, c'est la révolution. Cet engagement aussi s'est manifesté à travers l'engagement d'autres personnes, surtout des anonymes, qui, dans les communautés, ont aidé à ce qu'il y ait une émergence de personnes et de personnalités pour faire face au pays à Sida. Des actions importantes ont été menées notamment avec Traitement Action Campaign en Afrique du Sud, qui a mené le combat pour l'accès aux ARV génériques. Dès 1997, l'Odicida a formé les acteurs communautaires à la dispensation ou à la distribution d'ARV. Et les premières formes de distribution d'ARV sont apparues avec euh, des organisations comme OBF du Togo, REF Plus au Burkina, mais aussi ARSS au si la service du Sénégal aussi a été la première organisation à faire la distribution d'ARV au niveau communautaire. Tout ce travail, Diapo, Diapo, tout ce travail a permis à la société civile et aux acteurs communautaires d'avoir des acquis majeurs dans la réponse au VIH. Avec une meilleure connaissance de l'épidémie, au ciblage des groupes vulnérables, mais aussi l'amélioration continue de l'accès des services aux soins de traitement au niveau des communautés. 30 ans de lutte contre le SIDA nous a permis aussi d'avoir une expertise certaine. La labellisation de l'expertise communautaire et la consécration avec le financement à double bois qui a été octroyé à une organisation de la société civile en l'occurrence ASS dès 2005, 
qui fait la première organisation de l'Afrique à être récipiendaire de l'intérêt par le Front mondial. Ce travail a été fait par des personnalités d'Abo qui, à travers leur engagement, se sont manifestés. Nous avons voulu aujourd'hui mettre quelques personnes ici dont on ne citera pas les noms, mais ils se reconnaîtront, certains sont dans la salle, pour le travail important qu'ils ont fait pour que la société civile soit un acteur incontournable dans la réponse au pays Yassida. Mais vous me permettrez quand même de rendre hommage à deux personnes qui sont dans cette diapo. Yao Bouna du Togo, qui nous a précédé, mais aussi, revenez sur la diapo, s'il vous plaît. Yao Bouna du Togo, mais aussi Ismaël Le Boudiabi du Sénégal, deux personnalités qui ont consacré toute leur vie à la lutte contre le pays Yassida. Nous voulons leur promettre ici que leur travail ne sera pas vrai. Parce que nous sommes debout, nous tenons le flambeau et nous mettons fort au VIH d'ici 2030. D'accord. Quelques exemples d'innovation des acteurs de la société civile et des communautés en Afrique. À travers, d'abord, le dépistage démédicalisé, qui aujourd'hui est une réalité. Les organisations comme Akarsida de Mali ont pu démontrer l'efficacité de ce travail, mais aussi les autres tests qui ont permis aujourd'hui de tester 31% de la population qui n'avait pas encore accès au dépistage sur la cible. Le soutien et le traitement à travers la distribution génétique dans les désert communautaire, c'est une réalité au Burkina, en Guinée, au Mali, au Kenya, dans beaucoup de pays d'Afrique maintenant. Les observatoires communautaires à travers le projet de ITPC, qui a pu démontrer, avec le travail qui est fait, l'observatoire, mais aussi de collecte d'informations probantes pour le suivi de la disponibilité des ARD, mais aussi qui joue un rôle important d'alerte et de paye pour informer les politiques sur le traitement des ARD, la disponibilité des médicaments pour une meilleure prise en charge des personnes qui vont avoir des ARD. D'abord, le développement et le renforcement des soins à domicile. Ici, nous voulons citer l'exemple de Douleur sans frontières en Mozambique qui a créé une unité pour gérer les douleurs, mais aussi accompagner les malades pour un meilleur traitement. L'accès des personnes handicapées au VIH et au traitement euh, aussi a été une innovation majeure à travers la désorganisation de la société civile pour citer le projet Access au Sénégal, euh, conduit par handicap, et, par handicap international pour l'humanité et l'inclusion, mais aussi le projet régional qui a valu un travail extraordinaire. Cette organisation-là a fait qu'aujourd'hui, nous sommes dans, la, dans le processus de signature de la déclaration de Praia pour le meilleur accès des personnes handicapées aux autres de soins et de prise en charge du VIH. Bien bon. En ce qui concerne le ciblage de population clés, des programmes importants comme l'ILO, nous public à Blue qui a été initié par tous qui va être en 2010, a permis une meilleure connaissance de la communauté LGBTI de manière générale, des orientations, mais aussi des problématiques de genre pour une meilleure offre de services, des prestataires de soins et une non-discrimination de ces personnes. Nous avons aussi, comme exemple, la mise en place de clubs et de coups de bouteille de droit qu'on peut citer au Sénégal et à Nouveau-Maurice, mais aussi la documentation de cas de violation des droits résumés avec une dispositif réactif conduit par le. International Frontline X, pour vous permettre de faire beaucoup de plaidoyers avec des instances pour améliorer l'offre de services, mais aussi lutter contre la discrimination des de, 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 de populations claires. D'abord, dans le ciblage des populations claires aussi, le développement des cliniques communautaires qui a permis d'avancer l'offre de services, de l'amener là où le dispositif en général, de santé publique, le dispositif mis en place par la santé publique ne peut pas arriver. Avec l'offre de services avancés dans les communautés, dans les autres sports, trouver les personnes les plus vulnérables là où ils avaient, là où ils vivent, pour les offrir des soins de, 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 de qualité. Il y a aussi la mise à disposition des médailles communautaires, qui est aussi une innovation majeure pour les communautés, avec les prestataires de soins du secteur public, travaillent ensemble à offrir une meilleure prise en charge aux populations pleines, mais aussi aux personnes qui ont besoin de payer à ce moment-là. D'abord, 
Le ciblage de CDI, là, nous voulons nous arrêter véritablement parce que nous voulons lancer une utilité à l'arrière. Les consommateurs de drogues injectables sont en marge de nos droits. Ils ne sont pas suffisamment pris en compte. L'ASS, à travers le projet Parico, qui est un projet régional sur cinq pays d'Afrique de l'Ouest, a donné des études d'estimation de taille, des cartes de des études de bien comportementales, dont les résultats vous seront présentés dans un symposium de la du Conseil. Vous invitons tout le monde à venir participer, parce que les données que nous avons, c'est des données extrêmement importantes, mais aussi inquiétantes pour ces pays. Nous voulons, par exemple, prendre le cas du VIH, où, dans certains pays, les CDI ont des taux de prévalence dix fois plus supérieurs que la moyenne nationale. Les comorbidités, comme le VIH, l'hépatite B, l'hépatite C, mais aussi la syphilis, sont des réalités au niveau de ces groupes-là qui ne sont pas pris en charge dans nos programmes. Le projet Parico prévoit pour ces mesures, nous nous invitons à avoir l'ensemble des informations. D'abord, quelques réalisations qui ont, qui ont été faites avec euh, ce projet-là. La mise en place d'unités d'addictologie à l'hôpital Yandéado du Burkina, à l'hôpital Osbaldo de, 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 de la Guinée de Sao, mais aussi le travail important que nous faisons avec le CPA, le centre de prise en charge des admissions de Dakar, qui est la première expérience en Afrique de l'Ouest pour la prise en charge des consommateurs de drogue végétale. Donc, nous vous invitons véritablement à venir à ce, ce symposium pour découvrir les informations et les données scientifiques qui prouvent effectivement que nous ne pourrons pas arriver à arrêter le pays à ce que nous ne prenons pas en compte les consommateurs de drogue végétale. Pour la conclusion, l'engagement des communautés et le leadership de la société civile ont permis de développer des approches innovantes qui ont impacté positivement le pays de la CEDA. Ça, je pense que tout le monde ici dans la salle peut en parler. Cependant, la suppression des barrières socioculturelles et juridiques et la fourniture de services aux populations clés, des PS, des ACHS, des CDI, est un défi majeur. Nous devons tous nous mobiliser pour que ces communautés-là aient accès à l'offre de services de prise en charge de prévention et de gouvernement du VIH si nous voulons arrêter le VIH. La reconnaissance de l'expertise communautaire est indispensable. Je pense que 30 ans de lutte a montré que les communautés ont une valeur ajoutée, ont de l'expertise, et cette expertise-là, ils le mettent au service de l'ensemble des acteurs de la lutte contre le SIDA pour contribuer de manière significative à l'élimination du VIH. La disponibilité et l'accessibilité des ressources aussi nous permet d'avoir des réponses efficaces adaptées aux besoins pour mettre fin au pays à cela. Mais tout cela, nous devons le faire diapo en travaillant ensemble. Le VIH, la fin du VIH est une possibilité, mais elle ne se fera pas sans les communautés. Et les communautés appellent l'ensemble des autres acteurs à travailler ensemble diapo pour mettre fin au VIH. Comment nous le faisons? C'est en nous donnant la main, la main dans la main, le secteur public, le secteur communautaire, le secteur privé, mais l'ensemble des partenaires publics et financiers pour que véritablement notre objectif de mettre au VIH puisse se faire parce qu'elle ne se fera pas sans la société civile, elle ne se fera pas aussi sans les autres secteurs. Diapo, les remerciements, c'est à l'ensemble du gouvernement, à la société civile, au CCM mais aussi au sein de l'Est et au partenaires techniques et financiers qui nous ont aidés dans la communauté d'information pour faire cette présentation. Un mention spéciale à vous, c'est Adil Fall, qui nous a permis de rassembler toutes les informations pour faire la présentation. Je vous remercie de votre attention. Merci. Véritablement à M. Masuki Jadou qui nous a présenté euh, comment les acteurs communautés ont véritablement contribué à la lutte contre le SIDA et peuvent de façon effective continuer à s'impliquer, à contribuer pour la fin du SIDA comme nous le souhaitons tous. Je voudrais vous demander de l'applaudir très fort pour cette Présente, uh, 
Professor James Hakim is uh, one uh, of the famous scientists in Africa and um, personality. That's, uh, so I'm very I'm happy to present him to uh, the participants. Professor James Hakim is Professor of Medicine, formerly Chair of the Medicine at the University of Zimbabwe College of Health Science. He is the director of the University of Zimbabwe Clinical Research Center and the OBI uh, in the collaborative research program. Professor Akim was the principal investigator of the UMP program. He is currently the PI of the MP Genome Faculty Awards, an initiative for advanced research training for genome academic students. Professor James Adin has was trained at Makerere University, Uganda, University of Nairobi, Kenya, UK, University of Newcastle, Australia, University of Cape Town. He is a postdoc in cardiology and Germany. He is a fellow of the Royal College of Physicians of London in Edinburgh. In 2016, he was awarded the Doctor of Science degree in Medicine by University College London. There are diverse research interests, including HIV AIDS, opportunistic infection, cardiovascular disease. He has been involved in seminar HIV research, funding and collaborating, collaboration with MLC, CTU, UK AIDS, NIH, EDCPP. He has authored co authors for more than 150 articles, book chapters, scientific communication. He is a member of several national and international organizations and focusing regularly advisory programmatic training and scientific portfolio. He is also board of the member of the board of SAR. Professor Hakim, we have a Good morning. It's my singular honor to introduce an exceptional scientist, Dr. Wafa Asad. She is the director of ICAP, Columbia University. Uh, she is a university professor of epidemiology and medicine, Columbia University, the director of ICAP, State University, and director of the Global Health. Initiative at Mainland School of Public Health. Dr. Asad founded ICAN, a global health center situated at the Columbia Mainland School of Public Health, which is focused on addressing major global health threats, health system strengthening, and provides technical assistance, implementation support for strengthening health systems, in partnership with governmental and non governmental. 30 countries around the world. In this role, she leads the design, implementation, scale up, evaluation of large scale programs and, and research, including on HIV, tuberculosis, malaria, maternal child health, among other public health challenges. She is a prominent researcher and has led numerous epidemiological clinical behavioral. She is the principal investigator of the NIH funded uh, HIV prevention trials network, which seeks to prevent HIV transmission globally. Dr. Sutton was named the John B. and Catherine T. MacArthur Foundation Fellow and is a member of the National Academy of Medicine. In 2013, she was appointed investigator professor of Columbia's highest academic honor. She is a fellow of the African Academy of Sciences. She also holds the Dr. Matilda Kim Amfa Chair in Global Health of Columbia University. Our topic for this plenary is 
integrated in child care with emerging infections, comorbidities, and NCD. And virus, Dr. Asaj. Good morning, everyone. Uh, it's a great pleasure to be here. It's always a pleasure to be at Picasso, and I'm particularly thrilled to be here in Kidal and Rwanda again. And I'm honored to be introduced by Professor James Hakim, who's one of my heroes. Uh, he is a rare individual who's an amazing scientist, wonderful clinician, and a remarkable human being. So it's an honor uh, to be introduced by him. So, uh, what I'm going to try to do today, uh, quickly, is to really convince you uh, this talk, the importance of focusing on the individual, on the person uh, who's living with HIV, and the, particularly the need to prioritize the integration of HIV and non communicable diseases for such an individual. Next one. So here's my pipeline. I'll first uh, talk about the challenge, uh, the challenge ahead of us, which is both the challenge of HIV as well as non communicable diseases or NCDs. Then I'll touch on some of the lessons learned from the HIV scale up that really guide us as we're thinking about how to tackle the onslaught of non communicable diseases. Then I'll move on to giving you some examples of integrating non communicable disease services into HIV programs and end with the summary and some conclusions. Next slide. So, all while here at this conference, of course, we all are keenly aware of the burden of disease in HIV prevalence in Sub-Saharan Africa, the region where we're at now. And you can see from the map on the left, on your left, uh, from the UNAs, is the high, very high prevalence in the deepest uh, blue, but also the diversity of prevalence across the continent. On the right, you'll note that of the almost 38 million people living with HIV around the world, the vast majority are living uh, in this region with 7.7 uh, million people living with HIV in, in, South, in South Africa, uh, just one country, and more than a million people living with HIV in uh, eight African countries. Next slide. Now, there is good news. There's actually great news. And you can see that on the figure on the left, with the decrease in blue, the remarkable decrease in mortality, with the scale up of antiretroviral therapy. As you heard, now more than 24 million people living with HIV uh, around the world and more in income countries have access to treatment. And remarkably, in developed countries now, on the right upper hand corner, you can see that a person uh, with HIV diagnosed at age 20 who is on antiretroviral therapy uh, has a life and can live for uh, approximately 71 years, which is compared to 79 years in the person without HIV. So we have coined the expression of the need to achieve the force 90, uh, meaning that we need to achieve a healthy aging for people living with HIV. Next slide. Now there is a substantial burden, of course, of disease of NCDs in Sub-Saharan Africa. And this is highlighted by a very recent uh, publication in Lancet Global Health in October of this year. And I'm abstracting just one, uh, one statement, which in which is on the slide. There has been a surge in the burden of NCDs in sub Saharan African countries over the past two decades. And NCDs are set to overtake communicable disease, maternal, neonatal, and nutritional diseases combined as the leading cause of mortality in sub Saharan Africa by 2030. So we need to be prepared as to how we're going to tackle the onslaught of NCDs overall in the general population. In addition, of course, among people living in each other. Now, in this slide on the left, you will see in red this is the mortality overall death uh, in sub Saharan Africa for all ages. And in the red and orange is mortality due to communicable diseases, including HIV, TB, malaria, as well as nutritional diseases and maternal and neonatal conditions. And then in the blue, mortality due to non communicable diseases. And you can see that. Already, we are seeing here that um, a third of mortality at all ages in sub Saharan Africa are due to non communicable diseases. And on your right, in the figure there, you'll see in the blue, the light blue color, that the majority 
of the disability adjusted white years due to NCDs in Sub Saharan Africa is due to cardiovascular disease. Next slide. Now, of course, mortality uh, from NCDs is particularly high amongst older individuals. And as I mentioned to you earlier, people living in HIV are living to older ages and living well and healthy lives. So we need to think about NCDs for this growing population. And in this map, you can see here on the left in men, on the right in women, in the age group between 50 and 69 years of age. Again, in blue is the contribution of mortality from NCDs. Much higher in men on your left and in women on your right uh, in all parts of Sub Saharan Africa. And as you can see, particularly amongst men, substantial high proportion of deaths in this age group are due to NCDs. Next slide. Now, what about NCDs amongst people living with HIV? Now, people living with HIV are exposed to the same NCD risk factors as their HIV negative uh, peers in the same communities. They may also have additional NCD risk factors due to HIV itself, the replication of the virus, and due to some antiretrovirals medications. And this leads to a substantial, I think you go back. This leads to a substantial uh, burden of NCDs among people living in HIV. Next slide. And why is that the case? There are lots of reasons uh, that metabolic complications are noted amongst people living with HIV. Aging is one important factor. Genetics, chronic immune activation, and inflammation contribute to non communicable diseases, environmental, behavioral, and other factors, as well as some antiretroviral therapies, as I mentioned. These lead to metabolic complications and then, of course, lead to increasing death due to non aids morbidity and mortality. Next slide. Now, this just shows the, me the me mechanisms and pathogenesis of non communicable disease among people living with HIV due to the replication of the virus itself, which leads to activation of monocytes and macrophages causing inflammation, as well as disruption of altered or altered coagulation, leading to uh, again, coagulation uh, abnormalities, and both of these lead to vascular dysfunction and ultimately to uh, the complications that we are hopefully trying to avoid, particularly because of vascular disease, but also other NCD complications. Next. So in many places, including in Sub-Saharan Africa, HIV, NCD, and NCD are synthetic. And synthetics, this, uh, this term means that two or more diseases that cluster within a population. We are seeing this and are going to see it more and more in this region. And this means that both of these conditions uh, exist because they're biological as well as psychosocial and social interactions that enable uh, both of these conditions to occur. Next slide. Now, the question is what is the prevalence of NCDs among people living in China? We did several studies, uh, but we need more. But nonetheless, there have been several studies. Uh, the top study, that figure uh, that you can see on the right, is from a study by Portal et al. from uh, about a year ago in AIDS. And uh, the authors did a systemic review and meta analysis of the literature. And they noticed that from all of the literature, that the prevalence of hypertension was more than 20%, hypercholesterol, again, more than 20%, obesity, 15%. Depression close to 25% and diabetes about uh, 3%. Uh, this is pretty high prevalence. This is amongst people living in each other. Then, been other studies that have also shown and uh, confirmed this, sometimes from Kenya, 51% of Kenyan adults and 62% of Kenyans living with each other have either one or more incidents. So, overall, we know that the burden of NCDs is very high amongst uh, people living in each other. Next slide. So this has motivated UNAIDS. Next slide. This has motivated UNAIDS in its global strategy uh, from 2016 to 2021 to support a multi-sector integrated uh, patient-centered approach uh, to try to tackle uh, NCDs, uh, both uh, HIV and cervical cancer, HIV and other NCDs, HIV and mental health, and to think of this in a holistic approach. And then, Four most common NCDs of people living with HIV or for vascular disease diagnosis. 
uh, mental mental uh, mental depression in particular depression in the fourth circle. Next slide. So let me move on to then uh, try to contemplate how we're going to tackle this onslaught of disease and what are the lessons learned from HIV that can shed and can really help us moving forward. Next slide. So about a year ago, there was a supplement from AIDS that's focused exactly on this question. And in uh, one of the papers that I'm quoting to Aaron Kuzby was about building on the HIV platform, taking the lessons learned and, and then inform us moving forward. We don't need to reinvent the wheel. We have learned so much from tackling the other chronic diseases, which is HIV, and therefore there's no need to reinvent the wheel. We can build on what we do. Next slide. So what are the key lessons in brief from the HIV response? And many of you are well aware of it. I think number one is the public health approach. Number two, differentiated service delivery or DSD. Critically important, number three is engaging recipients of care, nothing about us without us. And then fourthly, also a very important principle is the use of data for decision making. Next slide. So to scale up HIV programs, we realized very early on that we could not just deal with the tip of the iceberg, meaning we should not just deal with the people who show up already identified with HIV and come to the clinics. That you need to think holistically of a public health approach, meaning how are we going to reach everybody, people who are maybe HIV, living with HIV but are unaware of HIV infection or those who are not in treatment. So to think holistically of a public health approach which is the whole population, not just the tip of the iceberg. Next slide. And what the public health approach in, in brief is all about is this is the single most important strategy uh, approach that has taken us to where we're at now, more than 24 million people are in treatment, is that recognize the need for a simple, straight, streamlined service approach that delivers uh, in fragile health systems. That uses consistent package uh, that's undifferentiated, uniform ERC regimen, monitoring the strategy and algorithmic approach. And this allows the decentralization reaching everybody, as well as, of course, uh, decentralization, as well as fast thinking and fast sharing amongst different cultures of households. Next slide. But increasing coverage was insufficient, meaning that just getting more and more people to be tested and more and more people to be in treatment is insufficient. That was the importance of coverage, but also of quality in order for us to achieve impact. Next slide. And how can we achieve quality? The realization was that we needed to think differently. So the initial success of the public health approach brought some new challenges. The most important one is, of course, that millions of people are on treatment, which is great, but that has led to overcrowded health facilities and overworked staff. I'm sure many of them in this room here today. As well as the successful treatment also indicated that we don't need such intensive models. Less intensive models are needed and the importance of uh, quality and satisfaction of uh, the recipients of care themselves. And this moved us to DSD, the French Service Delivery Models, uh, which I am uh, calling here, or let's call it uh, uh, Public Health Approach to Porto. And this means the need to simplify and adapt HIV to specific population, and then that includes both facility, as you know, and community-based services. So we're building on public health 1.0 and now public health 2.0. These are important lessons learned, and we should think about that as we're shaping our progress with this disease. Next slide. So what is the French service delivery? As all of you know, it is really shaping services to the needs of the recipients of care by modifying the intensity of the delivery of the service frequency, the location of the service and the service provider. Next slide. The second and very important lesson learned from the HIV response is involving treatment. And that's critical, obviously, that's also part of the theme of the CASA, uh, the 20th CASA conference, right? Next slide. And I think an important principle that I mentioned is the need for data for decision making. And sometimes we forget how much we use data in the HIV response, which is fantastic. At the same time, we also have to appreciate the paucity of strong data or accurate data on NCDs in many of countries all over the world, not just in Sub-Saharan Africa. 
So we do know now from surveys like the FIA surveys, for example, we do know that 1999, next slide, uh, next slide. We do know that scare cascade for several countries that have had surveys, including the Rwanda. What proportion are aware of their diagnosis? What proportion are in treatment? What proportion are already suppressed? And we certainly don't have the same information for NCDs. Next slide. For example, we have no idea about the hypertension cascade. This is a huge gap. What proportion of the population does have hypertension? Or what proportion are in treatment state or treatment? What proportion of developing complications of hypertension? Next slide. Similarly, we don't have the data for diabetes, again, the diabetes cascade. Again, showing that we have a lot of work to do to understand the cascades of these NCDs so that we can merge or integrate the management of the HIV and NCDs that are coherent in our work. Next slide. So these are the challenges. Now, what about integrating NCD services into the HIV program? There's been some efforts to do that, and I'll share with you some of the data we have. Next slide. Now, I think it's important to also acknowledge that while integration is intuitively appealing, this is a statement here, intuitively appealing, the evidence for its benefit remains uncertain. And therefore, it's incumbent upon all of us here to evaluate integration uh, programs very rigorously uh, so that we can actually learn what works and what doesn't. So although it's intuitively makes sense, we need more than intuition. We want to make sure that integration does not jeopardize the well-being of HIV program, and also that it's actually its benefit for both HIV as well as for uh, NCD outcomes for the people living with HIV. Next one. So there are lots of questions. First of all, uh, which conditions uh, are we want to integrate in HIV? Sexual reproductive health, mental health, cardiovascular disease, uh, chronic lung disease, cancer, others. That's a question. The second question is, what services are we integrating? Do we want to just integrate screening or want to integrate diagnosis or prevention, primary or secondary, or actually the treatment of several conditions together in each other? Next slide. And then we also need to think about integration at which level. I think most of us, when we think of integration, we think at the tip of the pyramid, integration the clinical services. But also, there are other ways of important uh, levels of integration that we need to think about. For example, monitoring and evaluation, the procurement systems, the laboratory systems are very important. And then there's a debate, the fundamental level is the need for integration potentially in terms of strategic planning, in terms of financing, policy development, and so on. Next slide. We also need to think about the health system itself. And we recognize that our shared health system barriers for a lot of conditions. If you think of HIV, the chronic disease, that's the first, the second column here, but then you think of diabetes or cardiovascular disease or heart disease or cancer or mental health, they all face the same shared health system barriers. And the solutions need to be across the board, but there are some lessons learned from HIV. There are barriers in demand generation, barriers in availability, barriers in terms of health worker shortages, Lack of adherence support, inadequate infrastructure, inadequate drug supply, and many, many other issues. And the universal of that we need to think systematically and not just work. Next slide. And therefore, attention to the health system building blocks is fundamental because we have to tackle all of those barriers. And that's another lesson we learned from the HIV response. We need to think of the financing of the services and human resources where the service delivery and how the service delivery models will shape the commodities, laboratories, et cetera. And of course, at the core of the health system building blocks uh, is the community itself. Next slide. There's been some uh, work that's been done on integrating NCD screening and HIV testing programs. For example, in a research study, the search study, which is uh, the trial which is done in Uganda and Kenya, which utilized a very novel approach of using health payers uh, to actually integrate multi-disease screening for not only HIV, but hypertension, diabetes, malaria, TB. And what they noticed is that by integrating this multi-disease screening, they actually increase the acceptability of uptake of HIV in those screenings. So we could gain, go back to this. So we could gain uh, from integration of screening uh, of HIV and other screenings. 
similarly in a, in a pilot program that I had did at one of the hospitals in Kenya, establishment of these booths, which you can see in the photograph, near the entrance to the hospital, people had been with the screen for HIV, hypertension, TB, as well as nutritional status, we found that this increased the proportion of men who tested for HIV. Next slide. Now, beyond other, other types of screening, what about integrating cardiovascular disease risk factor screening amongst people living with HIV? As I mentioned to you, cardiovascular disease is the biggest risk uh, in, the, in our population. There have been two uh, studies that we conducted. One was done with the Swatini amongst people created before the years of age of integrating the screening in HIV clinics and identified that 25% of people have hypertension, 9% were current smokers, 8% have elevated cholesterol, 5% have diabetes. In a similar study in a younger age group in South Africa, uh, similar uh, higher even rates of hypertension, close to 40% were known in Next slide. Now, some people may say it's complicated enough to do HIV care. Is it feasible to do uh, integration of CBD risk factor screening in the HIV program? And actually, in that study in Swatini, 100% of ERT clinics screened for CBD risk factors, and they perceived in that study the intervention was good for their health team and all say, said that they were recommended to, uh, to their friends. And the same study, the healthcare workers that we interviewed also uh, expressed favorable uh, responses, but we're concerned about the increase in uh, model. Next slide. Next slide. So, because of that concern, we did a, a time motion study to look at the burden of time in terms of the healthcare workers. And this is a study uh, that was done again, it's what gave close to 2,000 uh, participants on ERT who had screening for several. Uh, cardiovascular disease uh, risk factors, and 172 participants were followed through the time motion study. And what was found was that it took a median of four minutes for routine ART detail visits, and it took about 15 minutes to include the screen for the CBD risk factors. And actually, the most time consuming part of the activity was the point of care testing, as well as the blood pressure measurement and documentation of the results. Next slide. Now, what about treatment and integrated NCD treatment into HIV treatment programs? There have been some small programs, however, that is not been a large scale scale up. And that's what I want to end with this is that we need to scale up of these integrated programs. For example, uh, in the study, the heart study in introducing the SWOT TV, randomized people with heart ERT to either CBT risk factor management in the HIV clinic in an integrated way or referral to an outpatient department. And the good news is that the outcomes were quite similar for the two groups uh, for the people who got co-located care versus referral uh, to another um, clinic. The NPAF team in Kenya also retrospectively analyzed people on ERT hypertension who received co-located uh, chronic disease care in HIV versus those who got HIV treatment alone. And they, had, they noted the modest association of uh, better uh, BP control. MSF has also piloted a similar program in Kenya, found it feasible, acceptable, and stigma reducing, which is very important. And the Ministry of Health of Swatini is actually piloting now the VSD model for both here and also for hypertension. For hypertension. Next slide. So let me end up with a summary and some conclusions. Next slide. So I hope I've convinced you that successful NCT HIV integration will require the following. It will require to focus on NCDs with the high health. We need to be careful about selecting what makes sense. And this requires collecting the data to inform these decisions. What are the most important NCDs that one should focus on in this effort to integrate the services for people living with HIV? It is critical to use evidence-based algorithmic uh, approaches that can be delivered by non-physician clinicians. We have to remember that what made the scale-up of HIV treatment successful is this algorithmic approach, and therefore we have to mimic this as we as tackle NCDs. We have to build in primary and secondary prevention, which is very critical. One very important simple thing is tobacco cessation. 
We have to prioritize quality care diagnostics and enhance the coverage and give it easy to screen and diagnose in cases. We have to empower the recipients of care for self-management. We've done that fairly well with the ST models for HIV, but we need to expand that for also self-management of monthly communicable diseases. I think it is doable, and we have to move forward and develop the models and test the models and aim for the models. And then very importantly, we have to use a cascade approach uh, for monitoring the evaluation of the programs themselves. We need to make sure that as we're attempting to integrate uh, these programs and services, that we are keeping an eye on coverage and quality, and that these are achieved for both HIV as well as in the second condition of the second the second service that we're integrating with each other programs. We need to make the point, we need to prove that it is beneficial for both each other and as well as for the ACD as well. Next slide. So in conclusion, we must focus on all the health needs of the people we serve. It is very imperative that we do so and recognize that NCD and NCD spectrum are a reality that highly prevalent and they are getting if they're untreated and undiagnosed. This compels us to seek the most effective ways to deliver the services that people living with each other in an integrated manner at the highest cost. Next slide. And ultimately, I believe that it's time for us to move uh, from small pilot programs that have demonstrated some benefits, uh, both uh, in terms of the recipients of care as well as visibility acceptability by the providers themselves. We need to move those programs to scale up on each other and season integration in order for us to successfully tackle uh, these these impacts. Next slide. And I want to end by thanking you all for your attention. Thank you very much. May we give a round of applause to the distinguished panel? We have come to a short award ceremony for Swati. But before then, I have a one short announcement. This goes to the speakers and the presenters. Please be reminded that you are supposed to report to the faculty office at least 24 hours before your session. The faculty office is uh, in the room 85, located on the ground floor. Please note that we do not upload presentations in this room. Neither do we do that in any of the sessions. So please uh, take note of that. We will now present the award for track B, clinical science, treatment and care. And uh, the topic of the abstract is real-time medication monitoring improves our biological outcome and multiple living HIV on antiretroviral treatment in Moshi, Tanzania. The award will be presented by Dr. Shinto Nambinga, a board member of the Society for AIDS in Africa. She's also the treasurer for that. And the award winner is Kennedy Michael Gould. So, Kennedy, for the last four years, has been working as an ICT specialist at the Kilimanjaro Christian Research Institute. He has worked on several projects which employ the use of mobile phones to improve patient treatment and well being in Tanzania. He has successfully managed two studies which use and help to provide education for family planning and HIV AIDS. Kennedy is currently holding a PhD scholarship to investigate the effect of SMS and real time medication monitoring to improve adherence to the in the Kilimanjaro region of Tanzania. 
It is my pleasure to invite the Farm General to the award. And this award also goes to the cash for 10,000 US. So may I, may I invite Kelly to panel to motivate Kennedy to greater heights. <laughs> So thank you very much, and I uh, enjoy the rest of your day. Thank you very much. Oh, okay.